Okay. Attention, please. Uvaha, uvaha. Uh, this was billed as a working lunch, and the bad news for the panelists and me is we're the only people who are working. You guys get to eat this delicious food. But I do make a request, which is the panelists have given up the opportunity to have lunch and have traveled a long way to be here. So let's please be respectful of them and listen to them and not talk amongst ourselves while they're speaking. Uh, it's always a real challenge to be a speaker during lunch. So let's make their job easier, please. Uh, that won't be a sacrifice for people here uh, because Victor and his team have assembled a really terrific, eclectic, mind-bending panel. And this, I think, is the perfect follow-up to the very serious, somewhat depressing economic conversation we had before lunch. Because what we're going to be talking about is really the stuff that Larry concluded with in the economic panel. The real new opportunities, the exciting new technologies, the new frontiers that we are now, that are now opening up. And we have a real, a really thrilling opportunity to hear from some of the people who are the most exciting, most innovative explorers of that frontier. And as you can see, uh, many explorers of the frontier are very, very young. They could be our children or our grandchildren. And that is absolutely appropriate because that's the people who find new worlds. So what I'm gonna do is very quickly introduce the panel and then I'm gonna let each of the panel, I'm go going to invite each of the panelists to tell their story. Maybe we'll have a little conversation afterwards and then you can have a chance to ask them questions. So we have farthest away from me, Khadija Niaza. She is a student at the Lahore College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and as a young woman studying in Pakistan has some very interesting insights about education and the new world to share with us. Next to her is Jack Andraka. He's an inventor, a scientist, and a cancer researcher, and won the Intel ISEF Grand Prize in 2012. Next to him is Daphne Collar. Uh, she is the co-CEO of Coursera, which is probably the leading online education company, really a huge force in this space of online education and MOOCs, which is transforming the whole way that we learn. Uh, next to her is Michio Kakuku, uh, Kaku, who is a chair and professor in theoretical physics in the City College of New York. And he, although an absolutely brilliant theoretical physicist, he also has a very special ability to talk about physics in a way that is comprehensible to those of us who are not nearly as brilliant. And next to him is Anton Stepanov. He is a Ukrainian inventor, and he will show us one of his inventions. He's a Ukrainian inventor and student in Donetsk, and he'll show us one of his inventions. So I would actually like to start with Khadija. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, about what it is like to be a young woman studying in Pakistan, and what is exciting you the most right now? Well, in Pakistan, uh, in the cities, the education system is quite good. And uh, even though I have already studied uh, beyond my class level, it's really fun to relearn those stuff which I've already learned online from uh, courses from Coursera and other uh, platforms. So uh, in school, um, I learn my normal stuff, and when I reach home, I sometimes, if I have some free time, I start doing online courses. And there I focus all my mind onto the lectures, and then I attempt the quizzes. And I try to do them as quick as possible so that uh, later I have more time for my school. Okay, and what online, online course are you working on right now? Um, right now I'm doing calculus and from Big Bang to Dark Energy. And um, I'm also doing a Learn to Program the Fundamentals. Uh, it's the second offering of 
uh, calculus and the programming course. So three courses consecutively. And what's your favorite computer language? Python, because that's the only one I'm already familiar with and the only one. Yeah. Okay, there's a real shortage of Python developers in New York right now, mm -hmm. so you're well positioned. What, uh, and I'm asking this for Daphne's benefit, I see that she's listening to you with great care. What makes a good online course? Um, the programming course is uh, really easy to understand and it's really nice that the professor show live examples and the quizzes are also medium hard. That means all the people who did not understand the lecture can improve their understanding by doing the quizzes. And then there come the assignments where you have to submit your own code. Yeah, that's a bit challenging that you have to create your own code. But I've been doing two uh, assignments successfully. And where do you think you're learning more right now? From these online courses that you sneak in after school or from your lectures? Um, from the online courses, I guess, because they are more in depth and I can do them anytime I want. Plus, there are those subjects which are not yet on my level, and uh, those subjects are my interest, so I can broaden my learning experience. So I think I learn more on online courses. Do, do you get any interaction with the other students, or is it a very solitary thing? Actually, I'm quite a social person on online courses. Love to make threads on forums, like to make friends, and Right now, I currently have many friends from online courses who I stay in touch with on Google Plus and Twitter. So tell us a little bit about how that works, because I'll bet who in this room has taken an online course? Okay, we only have, okay, so very small numbers of people. So I'm afraid, uh, Khadija, we need you to educate us. So explain how the online course works and how you interact with other students. Well, first of all, you enroll in the courses, and then uh, the weekly lectures, you watch them, you try to understand what the professor is teaching you, and later, at the end of the week, you get the quizzes, where you got to challenge your understanding, and after you do the quizzes, you really know if you have understood the week's uh, information or not. And also, there are the discussion forums where you can interact with other students, ask them questions about where you're lacking or what you're doing wrong. And then there are lots of positive responses from the students online too. I hate to ask such a direct question, but how old are you, Khadija? I'm 12 and I'm going to be 13 uh, one day after I arrive back home. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So a last question to you. Um, it's clear you're absolutely brilliant. Um, we hear so much about how hard it is. I mean, I, I'm the mother of two girls and a young boy. It's hard for me to get my kids to study. Um, what is it like being a brilliant young woman in Pakistan? Do you feel doors are open to you? Yeah, there are lots of opportunities for children like me and there are surely many children like me in my country because many of us have this passion for learning and I think we can develop this passion in other students as well because they all have some sort of goal in their mind, something they want to learn, something they want to become when they grow up. Does being a girl make it harder? No, uh, not in cities because uh, in cities there are educated people but yes, there might be some problems in rural areas and those are also going to be fixed soon if you try to educate the parents about how if your child is brilliant, then they can become great things for the family. Okay, thank you so much. It's really inspiring to hear your story. Thank you. Jack, tell us about your invention. So I developed a new way to attack pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of diagnosis, but also could be used for ovarian and lung cancer and can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, 
when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. And it only requires a pinprick of blood and is about the size of a diabetic test strip. And within five minutes, you're able to tell whether or not you have cancer so far with 100% accuracy, even in the earliest stages. And it could be broadly applicable to pretty much any disease, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Okay, can you explain to us in a way that I could understand how it works? Yeah, so essentially you have these things called carbon nanotubes. And those are long, thin plates of carbon that are an atom thick and one fifty thousandth the diameter of your hair. So extremely small, but they have these incredible properties, kind of like the superheroes of material science. Then you take what's called an antibody, which is essentially like a lock and key protein. It only reacts with one specific protein, in this case, a cancer biomarker that's found in your bloodstream. And essentially, you weave in these antibodies into this network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, due to the properties of carbon nanotubes, it will change its electrical conductance, or how electricity flows through it, based on how much of this protein is present, and thus tell me whether or not you have pancreatic cancer. And so that's what makes it so applicable, is you can just switch out that antibody and thus detect a different protein. So you can track like what different drugs are going to be most effective, how well those drugs are working on your cancer, and so it has this host of applicability in the entire medical field. How did you come up with the idea? Uh, so I actually came up with it in my high school biology class. I was In your high school biology class? Yes. And so essentially I had snuck in an article on these carbon nanotubes and I was reading about all their properties and we were essentially learning about antibodies and kind of just stuck two and two together and then I did use in order to make this network, essentially it's a simple dipping process. You take some carbon nanotubes, it's like a lot like making chocolate chip cookies. You take some water, pour in the nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, and then you take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. Wow. We're can I ask, where did you go to high school? Uh, I go to an inner city public high school. We have the worst SAT scores in our in, entire In which state. city? Baltimore. And tell us how terrible your school is. Uh, so it's um, not the best of schools. I mean, like, there's a STEM program there, but like, it, we have the worst SAT schools in the entire state. We don't really have any microscopes. We have really high gang activity. And so it's an interesting place to go to, especially for scientists. Okay, and so how in this intellectual desert were you able to come up with such a smart idea? Uh, I just used Google and Wikipedia because at the beginning of this, I didn't even know what pancreas was, and so much less what pancreatic cancer was. And so I just Googled everything about, and I searched through a database of over 8,000 different proteins to find the one protein that would work, and then I just kept researching until I came up with it. Is this being commercialized? Uh, so right now I hold the international patent on this technology, and I currently have it under a holding company, and I'm talking with seven large uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies about licensing out and getting it on the market as soon as possible. Okay, are you looking for some investors here? Martin was talking earlier about how there's a glut in capital. Do you want any people to come up to you afterwards? And uh, So I am still a high school student, so I'm mostly interested in licensing it because I have other more important things like high school prom and homecoming. But um, So mostly I'm focusing, um, now my efforts are on the Tricorder X Prize sponsored by the Qualcomm Foundation, which is a $10 million prize to develop something the size of a smartphone that can diagnose any disease. I have a team of all high schoolers working on that. And so that's can where can my diagnose, Let me stop you, Jack. Something the size of a smartphone that can diagnose any disease. Yeah. So this is like a Star Trek type wand that yeah. I just wave at someone and it says if they're sick or not? Pretty much, yeah. And you're developing one? Yes, with a team of all high school students I met at these science competitions. Okay, when are you gonna be done that? Uh, so the deadline is actually um, this June, I believe, and so we are going to be finished by April, probably. And so far, we're just finishing up our trials. So we're not gonna need doctors anymore? We're just all have these little smartphones and diagnose ourselves? Yeah, and that's what's so exciting is that we're going to be really progressing towards this mobile health, where essentially everyone's their own doctor and are able to diagnose themselves instantaneously. Wow, okay, when do you graduate? 
Uh, I graduate in 2015. I'm a junior right now. So, so you're in grade 10? 11. Grade 11. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. That's so wonderful. Okay, Daphne, uh, top those exciting stories and tell us about the revolution that you are bringing to the whole way that we learn. So um, I guess uh, the revolution, the New York Times labeled 2012 the year of the MOOC, the massive open online course. Um, the revolution actually started in September 2011 with an experiment that we at Stanford University, I'm a professor at Stanford, among other things, um, we decided to take three classes that have been available only to Stanford students and put them out there for anybody around the world to take for free. Um, within a matter of, we were expecting an enrollment maybe of a few thousand people in each of those courses, but within weeks each of them had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. So imagine that, one professor, 100,000 students, all learning together, as Khadija told us, as a learning community, learning with each other and, and doing Stanford quality work. So that really, I think, um, made us realize that we had a, an amazing opportunity here because up until now, education has really been a privilege of the very few. And we now had an opportunity to take an amazing education and present it to everybody around the world at effectively a zero marginal cost per student because the cost of these courses per student is closer to zero dollars than to one dollar. And so in 2012, we decided to spin this out of Stanford and work with multiple universities to take some of the best courses from the best professors and offer them to everyone. We launched in April of 2012. We had four university partners, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan and 200,000 students that were left over from the, from the Stanford courses in the fall. As of uh, now, of 16 months later, we have uh, 87 university partners from, U from North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, Australia. Uh, we have uh, 440 different courses across the range of disciplines. Um, we have close to five million students and each one of those courses has about, on average, 40 to 50,000 students enrolled in them. 40% uh, of our students are in the developing world, uh, many from countries that do not have any kind of uh, well-established educational system. And for those people, this is really their one and only chance at a high-quality education. And so we're very proud of that. OK, so Daphne, this is just the beginning of the revolution. How? Can you look ahead 10 or 20 years and tell me how this revolutionary movement that you're sort of in the vanguard of is gonna change our world? So education is really the great equalizer. Um, and if you look at, uh, for example, the problems that ail the developing world, and you can list them. You can talk about overpopulation, infant mortality, malnutrition, unemployment, extremism, even AIDS. There are studies that show that if you, if you strat stratify by education, the more educated the population, the lower the um, prevalence of these problems. So if you can provide education to people, you can really start addressing a whole range of different problems that exist around the world. But how do you provide education to people? It's not that easy. So if you look, for example, at India, which is, a, I think, a very uh, striking example, India wants to raise its uh, college completion rate from 13 to 30%. 30% is on the low end, but still within the range of what OECD countries have. 13% is very, very low. In order for India to achieve that goal using traditional techniques, they would have to um, build 1,500 academic institutions. Now, even if you ignore the somewhat daunting logistics of building 1,500 campuses in India, um, currently, education institutions within India are at about 25% staffing levels because there are not enough qualified instructors to staff even the existing colleges. So where are you going to staff those new 1,500 institutions? The only way to do that is by providing a different medium for instruction that is much more scalable, affordable, and accessible to people than traditional brick-and-mortar education. 
Uh, Daphne, how has the Academy, the American Academy, responded to this? Are all of your fellow professors equally enthusiastic? Um, well, I think there's a lot of variation, as you would expect. There's a lot of our colleagues that are very enthusiastic. I mean, somebody's teaching those 440 courses. A lot of people are really excited about the opportunity to bring their ideas to 50,000 people. And a lot of people are very enthusiastic about the idea of providing a free education to so many people around the world. But then, of course, there are the people who are worried that it's going to put them out of a job. And so there is a certain amount of angst and, and even backlash about, oh, will computers replace um, humans in education? Are you dehumanizing the educational experience? And I think that the message here is that if what you're offering to your students can be um, provided equally well by a computer, then maybe you shouldn't be teaching. Maybe you should be doing something else. Um, what you sh I think that a human in the classroom has a critical function, but it shouldn't be to stand there and deliver something that could be just as well delivered by a machine. And Coursera, are you going to be the next uh, digital billionaire on the basis of this? Um, I don't know if we're, I don't know if I'm going to be a digital billionaire, but I hope that we become a sustainable enterprise that will allow us to continue to offer free education to everyone. And we're very proud of the fact that in our second year, we've so far in just eight months made over a million dollars in revenue and growing. So we're hoping to become sustainable and be able to continue doing this. And you're gonna keep doing it for free? That's the, that's the goal. We want, I mean, the, the purpose of this is to provide a free education to everyone. That's, that's the goal. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Michio, do you want to give us a little bit of your perspective on these revolutions and how they're changing our world? Well, I'm a futurist, and to understand the future, you sort of have to understand the past a little. For example, why are we speaking English today and not Chinese? 500 years ago, the Chinese had gunpowder. They had the compass. They had the largest fleet ever seen for the next 400 years. Why aren't we all speaking Chinese? Why aren't we speaking Arabic? Because after all, Algol, Altair, the names of the stars were labeled by the Arabs. Alcohol, algorithm, algebra are all Arabic words. You see, 500 years ago, Europe was burning witches. 500 years ago, they had the Inquisition. They burned Giordano Bruno alive in the streets of Rome for saying there could be life in outer space. Galileo was placed under house arrest. So what happened 500 years ago? Well, back then when the Chinese assembled this huge fleet, they went out to search for other civilizations and they found nothing to rival China. And I paraphrase, the emperor then said, is that all? There's no one to rival China? And what did they do? They burned the boats. They let the fleet decay, and they turned inward for the next 500 years. And in the Arab world, what happened? There was a debate among the philosophers of the Arab world. Where does truth come from? Does truth come from nature, or does truth come from the Koran? You see, if Allah is greater than nature, then you don't have to learn science. You don't have to learn nature. Because Allah can change nature anytime he feels like it. And the great Muslim empire stagnated for 500 years. The lesson here is you can ignore science and technology as much as you want. You just go bankrupt. You just become a second-class country. And China is not going to make that same mistake twice. Now, as a futurist, I then try to look 10, 20, 50 years into the future. And in 10, 20 years, chips will cost about a penny. That's the cost of scrap paper. So the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. So here's the good news. The internet will not only be in your glasses, but also in your contact lens. <coughs> so you blink and you're online. The person sitting next to you, you'll know who they are because you'll see their biography next to their image. And if they speak Chinese to you, your contact lens will translate Chinese into English. 
And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. And who else will find these useful? At a cocktail party, there are going to be some very important people out there, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will always know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. This means, this means an incredible advantage for developing nations. Instead of waiting years for technical journals to arrive in the mail, you can download them almost instantly simply by blinking. Cyber universities, e-education, we're going to see a leap forward. And the so-called digital divide that everyone worried about 10 years ago, the digital divide never happened. Because poor children are the first to go online. Because if you are not online and you're a teenager, you don't exist. You don't exist unless you're online. And the teachers are the first ones to try to learn from their students. The students are way ahead. So what we're witnessing is the digitalization of capitalism. One by one, major industries are being digitalized. The first was music. And we all see what happened if you ignore the digitalization process. You go bankrupt. You know who controls the music industry today? Apple Computers controls the music industry through iTunes. Now it's publishing. Media, newspapers are being digitalized. The Boston Globe, just a few months ago, was sold at a price 10%, about 10% of what it was originally bought for by the New York Times, a 90% loss in the purchase of a billion dollar newspaper. The next industries to be digitalized are education, transportation, and medicine. And this means things will be more efficient, we'll be able to access things much more efficiently, and more competition. So the nature of capitalism is changing. We're entering what is called perfect capitalism, when the laws of supply and demand become perfect. The next time you enter a grocery store, your contact lens will scan all the products, tell you who has the cheapest apples, who has the cheapest oranges. So supply and demand will become perfect. In fact, husband and wife's contact lens will be in contact with each other. So if the husband does grocery shopping and he always buys the wrong groceries, in the future the wife will tell the husband, no, 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 don't buy that apple, buy the other apple. And so medicine is being digitalized. Organs can now be grown from your own cells. We can now grow skin, cartilage, blood vessels, noses, ears. The first bladder was grown about five years ago. Windpipes were grown last year. And the next organ to be grown, listen up, the next organ to be grown is the liver. So for all you alcoholics out there, drink up tonight, hoping that we grow the first liver before your liver wears out. So what we're seeing is the digitalization of capitalism itself, making it more efficient, more accessible, better goods and services. That's the good news. The bad news is it's also affecting the job market. There's a lot of unemployment now out there, but ironically, there are plenty of jobs. Plenty of jobs. But these jobs cannot be filled because workers, for the most part, are not qualified because they are jobs that require science, education. So the lesson I'm saying is that science is the engine of prosperity. That's why China stagnated for 500 years. That's why we have to understand the importance of science and technology. And at an economic forum, I think we should have more scientists, not less. Because economics, in some sense, is the science of massaging money. Science is the art of creating money, not massaging money. For example, when politicians debate politics, it's always taxation. Tax A to, to pay for B. That's because politicians are former lawyers. Lawyers sue Peter to pay Paul. The pie gets cut thinner 
and thinner. I'm a physicist. We don't believe in cutting the pie thinner and thinner. We believe in creating a bigger pie. Let me tell you two inventions, two inventions made by quantum physicists. I'm a quantum physicist. Two of my colleagues made two inventions, the laser and the transistor. A huge chunk of the world economy came out of quantum physics. And there's a lesson there. Science is the engine of prosperity. OK, thank you. Since, since you're in Ukraine, uh, Michio, there are certainly a lot of people with scientific education here. I'll bet you among the Ukrainians, most people have an engineering degree. So it's pretty close. Um, and then our concluding presentation will be from a Ukrainian scientist, from Anton Stepanov. He's an inventor and a student at the IT Step Academy in Donetsk, and he is going to show us his invention and talk to us about it. I think Anton is going to speak in Russian. So if you don't understand Russian, please put on your headsets. Good morning. Good afternoon. I shall show you this invention. I shall show you my invention. This is the project presented by Ukrainian students at international competition. We won the major cup in Australia. The gloves that are going to help people with uh, speech deficiencies and with hearing deficiencies. Now the speech is transformed into pictures. Now I shall demonstrate how it's working. system really works. Yes, Ukraine. As you see, a person should just put on special gloves, switch it in, or link with a particular device with a computer, and make certain gestures that will be transformed into speech. Let me show how the system is working. The system is working with the use of these special glasses. The prototype was presented at competition in Australia and was highly assessed. It is provided with different form of sensors, like uh, something like modern smartphone. And using Bluetooth technology, information is transferred into a mobile device, smartphone or notebook, and where it is recognized, and we hear the sound. Uh, as I made the gesture, you hear the sound. It speaks only English, but also Russian, Ukrainian. This system could be uh, trained into any language. It doesn't matter. Uh, initially, we taught it English, and English gesture, you can teach it any language. This system has big future. But now this is a prototype of initial level, and very serious work is done to raise precision and accuracy, all technical characteristics, and raise number of sentences that it can recognize. And who invented it? You personal or the team? Initially, that was the idea of my scientific leader, and then we together started thinking about possible implementation, and we got this. Then we had a team of four who presented it in Australia at Microsoft competition. And why this idea came into head with your teacher? My scientific teacher, he has different kinds of ideas, in particular controlling computer with the eyes. And it was also presented. He's a very creative person, so he got an idea to make a kind of social project that is capable to help people with, with deficiencies. And on the basis of his idea, we tried to think how to make this device and to transform gestures into language. Different approaches were used, use of the camera. But then finally, we decided use of gloves is the most mobile technology. So we made such gloves. 
and is there a commercialization process? Now we are developing a prototype. We have support from Microphone, Dmitry Shinkin is here, support from government of Ukraine. So I think in the nearest future, it will be. A new prototype is being developed and manufactured. So I think in the future, we shall see a new prototype which will be a degree higher. When it becomes commercial, how much it will cost? Such gloves, well, it's not something very extraordinary. They don't have expensive details. They're rather electronic gadget. Its price will not be very high anyway. Do you have any other project in mind? Now we focus attention on this project. We want to finalize it. Okay, thank you. Everybody for these brilliant ideas. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? We can have a few. I want to let our brilliant speakers have some dessert or maybe even have lunch. So I want to let them go in a minute. But if anyone has any burning questions, you can go for it. Okay. Uh, there. Oh, one right there. Just speak really loudly. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Kaku a question because I'm always interested in the past of futurology, or um, which is to say that if you were to ask a futurist. 50 years ago, what the future would be like, we would have colonized Mars by now. Uh, and if you were to ask similar questions, say 80 years ago, we would be traveling uh, routinely across oceans, but we would be doing so on uh, helium, uh, helium airships. My question to you is, how do you explain past errors of futurists, and why is the current generation right where uh, your forebears were mistaken? I'm a futurist, but I realized that many predictions of the past were incorrect, mainly because they were made by science fiction writers, journalists, sociologists, cartoonists. Everyone asks me, when will I get the flying car? That's because we all watched a cartoon decades ago called the Jetsons. Physicists never said we're going to ha have uh, flying cars anytime soon because they're very expensive. We have them already. However, there's one science fiction writer who got it right on the button. Jules Verne in 1860 writes a manuscript predicting Paris in 1960. In 1860, in a time when Europe was convulsed with wars and kings and dictatorships and things like that, in 1860, Jules Verne talks about, in Paris, we will have glass skyscrapers. We will have something that looks like the internet. We will have fax machines. And we have cars using internal combustion engines. And then he wrote another book that around that same time, From the Earth to the Moon, calling for a moonshot. He got the time of flight correct. He got weightlessness correct. He got the size of the rocket correct. He got the launch point correct, Florida. He got the splashdown correct in the ocean. Why? Why is it that cartoonists and sociologists and journalists always get it wrong, but Jules Verne got it right in 1860? And the reason is scientists it were interviewed by Jules Verne. He got the latest in technology. But unfortunately, in the media, who does the media interview? Cartoonists science fiction writers, sociologists, journalists, and even economists. They never interview scientists, okay? I know that some of these predictions violate the laws of physics because they're made by cartoonists, okay? That's not to say that we physicists know the future. It's just that we understand the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry and biology. We know that some creations are just outlandish. We're not going to have a teleporter anytime soon for example, invisibility we may have in the coming decades, but not teleportation. And we know this. So to predict the future, it helps to know physics and not cartoonists. OK, I think Brett is going to promise to interview 10 scientists before the end of the month. Right, Brett? Um, and we are very lucky to have another very esteemed scientist in the room, Robert Fogel. 
uh, who is the principal education architect of Intel, and I think he was going to make a comment. Hi. I believe that many people in this room, maybe most people in this room, would agree that education is probably the cornerstone for economic development and social well-being. But the demands of the 21st century require more than what our current 20th century education system can deliver. And even a 21st century education needs to do much more than just improve academic outcomes. We must also prepare children with the critical 21st century skills so that they can participate as global citizens and be successful in today's global economy. Now, some of these skills include collaboration, both virtual and face-to-face, -face, strategic and analytical thinking. Also, some critical skills are entrepreneurship and experimentation, real-world problem-solving, innovation, communication. And probably the most important skill that we can help our children develop is the skill to learn how to learn, as demonstrated by many of these uh, esteemed uh, young uh, people up at the stage here. So we must find new ways to engage and reach our children and help them create the desire and motivation to want to learn. And we can successfully de um, develop these 21st century skills by providing equal access to 21st century education environments, like, for instance, what Ukraine is doing with the Open World Program. And in this program, they are providing many key elements that are necessary for 21st century education transformation. Some of these elements include state-of-the-art, ICT infrastructure in schools across the country, and potentially the use of universal service funds, also called a USF, to provide broadband internet connectivity to schools both urban and rural. Also, this program calls out for the professional development of teachers so that they can effectively use ICT in the classroom. Also, digital curriculum content in the Ukraine language. And finally, the persistent, affordable access to computer technology for both students and teachers. These are the key elements of a successful 21st century education transformation. I work with governments all over the world to implement successful education programs. And what I see with happening with education here in Ukraine are the positive, vital, active steps for the long-term success of the future generations of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from the floor? Okay, going once, going twice. I'm gonna ask the panelists to make some final remarks. And I'm going to start with Anton. Um, and what I'd like to ask each of you is, maybe you have some comment on the ideas you've heard from the other panelists. But what I'm particularly interested in is, what's the next thing? What's the new, new thing that you're thinking about that you're focused on? You've told us about the great thing you're working on now. Take me to the next level, the next stage. I think that now we live at the era of information technology. Now many similar projects appear. Young people are interested in projects more and more. I know it from my school. Uh, participation in competitions became possible thanks to Microsoft support. Very many interesting ideas were presented at the competition that I participated, very many social type projects. I think we are moving in the right direction. It's just social projects that are based on high technologies, will be most advanced in the future, and they will become 
um, the major factor for movement ahead. Already looked into the crystal ball for us, but do one more peek. Well, in the next 10 years, the computer will disappear. The word computer will disappear from the language. We'll never say the word computer anymore, just like we don't say the word electricity anymore, because electricity is everywhere and nowhere. In a 20-year time frame, we're talking about the brain. Instead of an internet, we will have a brain net. We will send memories. We will send emotions. We will send thoughts through the brain net. And already, breakthroughs are being made in the brain for the first time, allowing us to actually upload certain memories in mice, allowing us to actually record thinking. And one day, you'll be able to wake up and watch the dream that you had last night on your PC. This is not science fiction. The, basic, uh, the basics of this have already been done in the laboratory. And so when we have interactions in the future, when we walk into a room, we'll simply control things mentally. There's no more mouse. There's no more interface with your finger. You simply think and manipulate objects around you. And like I said, this is not science fiction. We can already do most of this. And this is the subject of my next book coming out in February, The Future of the Mind. The future of the mind, how we're going to control everything with our brains? Mentally, right. And how many of these things are already possible today. What about things like Antoine's invention? Are we also going to be wearing gloves and stuff that control things? Yes, we'll have an option. Option of using the mouse, option of simply waving our hands, or thinking. And which do you think we're going to choose? Personally, I like the idea of just thinking. Okay. Is it going to make it scary? Like when you were talking about the husband and wife contact lenses, I wondered whether I want my husband to know where I am at all times. We will have the off button, so you'll be able to shut everything off when you feel like it. <laughs> Daphne? Um, I think the main message that I took away from this panel is by looking at the three young people on this panel and seeing the amazing democratizing power of education. We're in three different continents, three young people, uh, by having access to some amazing education, we're able to sort of transcend into amazing inventions that um, you wouldn't have thought possible. I think that there's many brilliant young people all around the world and we don't know where the next Albert Einstein or the next Steve Jobs is going to be. And if we don't give them access to high quality education, they might not come up with the next great idea that will help change the world and bring it into where we would like it to be. So for me, this panel is a tremendous, tremendous validation of the power of education as we go forward. And I think that looking forward into the future, what we'll see is young people from different corners of the world not only being empowered by education and coming up with some great ideas, but also collaborating with colleagues around the globe to come up with ideas that maybe none of them would have come up with by themselves because they bring into this equation their own ideas that are um, inspired by their own culture and their own background. And I think that that will give us yet another uh, quantum leap in terms of the range of inventions that we could come up with. D does that mean, Daphne, do you see a time when you know, uh, Michio has told us that computers are going to cease to exist. Mm -hmm. Are physical universities going to cease to exist? Um, you know, I think, I think there is something to physicality. Why are we all here in a really remote part of the world that's really hard to get to, as opposed to doing this all by video conference? Um, I think there is something to being in the same physical space. Um, when people, when we moved to electronic digital music, people thought that um, maybe concerts, live concerts would go away, but they haven't. If anything, they've increased in popularity. I think people like being together in the same space. And so, no, I don't think it's going to be a substitute for that. Okay, great. Uh, Jack, what's the new, new thing? And I'd like to know, once you've finished this latest invention, what's the space you're going to be working in? Uh, so I particularly like working on uh, detection of various things. So right now I'm also working on environmental sensing. 
And so, so far, me and my team have developed something that detects eight different environmental contaminants, such as heavy metals and pesticides, simultaneously, down to parts per billion. And then also, we have made a filter using a common food additive and plastic bottles that uh, essentially filters out both heavy metals and pesticides as well. And so, I'm looking at environmental sensing and medical sensing in the future. And what do you think about Michio's prediction of the brain controlling everything? Is that going to happen? Uh, I definitely believe that that will happen very quickly just because of the exponential technology. I mean, our computer chips are getting continuously smaller, and probably like the next seven years, we'll have computers ingrained in our clothes. And I just like a quick response from you also to Daphne's vision of the power of online education. You've talked about how Google and Wikipedia were your libraries. Do you really see this being transformative for you and your generation? Yeah, because what is really amazing is the democratization of knowledge is that regardless of whether you're from Morocco, India, the US, or China, it doesn't matter. It's just your ideas that count. No matter what race or gender or age you are, you can still have a great idea on the internet. And that brings us to uh, another person who's a real example of this, Khadija. Tell me what the next new area is that you want to study. Well, next I would like to focus on those subjects which I haven't touched before. Like, um, maybe I want to learn calculus, uh, double variable or single variable after this. And I would really like to put some of my understanding into chemistry. And uh, I also want to focus on statistics because it will help me a lot. And I, I'm trying to really improve my math so much that I become an expert in maths. And Khadija, who do you want, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I'll become a mathematician or a physicist, or maybe both of them together, because uh, I'm really good in... Um, I think you have some voters here. <laughs> I think you have some supporters here, yeah. Uh, I have a really big passion for both maths and uh, physics, because I really like to understand how the world works, and what laws and what mathematical rules govern it. Okay, well I think we should have three cheers for science, for the future, and for our absolutely fantastic panel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all.